Welcome to, I think it's our 14th webinar for our specialist series this year, which is fantastic. Um, and my name is Richard Artingstall. I'm Director of Teleconsulting at VetCT and really, really pleased today to um, have Pilar talking on um, top tips for localizing lameness in dogs and cats, which should be really, really interesting. So um, I've just, I'm just take, gonna take this moment to introduce our service and talk about why we're here. So Pilar, if you want to just move on to your next um, slide, if you can. So as my role of director, it's my opportunity to say why we're here and, and what the purpose of these webinars are. But what we want to do is we really want to introduce you to our specialists um, behind the scenes to what we, to who work in the specialist advice service or teleconsulting service. Um, I'm sure you know about VETCT um, because you've enrolled in this, um, but just a brief introduction to VETCT. We're a global team of over 200 specialists and essentially at our core and our services, we're here to help you in practice or in whatever clinical situation you're in. Um, VETCT as a company specializes in three areas. The first one, which we're very well known for is exceptional radiology um, and diagnostic imaging interpretation. Um, we've also got a specialist advice arm, which is um, what we're introducing and talking about today. So Pilar is an integral part of that in our orthopedic team. And the third arm um, of VETCT is education services, where we support um, undergraduates and um, residents throughout their career and their journey in, in sort of um, radiology and, and diagnostic imaging. So with regards to the um, specialist case advice or teleconsulting, um, essentially what we offer and what we do um, is pretty simple really. We give you um, specialist advice to treat cases in house. So I like to think of us as an extension of your team and our team very much think that way as well. So it's almost like having a specialist on tap in a way. Um, we, we provide specialist written case advice within 12 to 24 hours, really fast turnaround times and often sooner. Um, and I think our average turnaround time is around about sort of two and a half to eight hours, depending on the speciality. Um, we've also got a very focused um, live availability in um, lots of different disciplines. So orthopedics is one of them, um, internal medicine, neurology and oncology between 12 and 4 p.m. in the UK, where you can actually pick up a conversation, live conversation with a specialist um, and that's one till five in, in Central European time, obviously, um, across uh, those four disciplines. But we have 11 different disciplines in our service. Um, what sort of stands us apart, apart from our team, really, is that we do pride ourselves in the specialist advice is, is really a, a partnership in, in how we manage cases in-house. So we provide unlimited follow-ups. Once you start a case, you can then go to the platform, interact with the specialist, ask further questions. And we see this, and we understand this with all cases, that they're ongoing processes um, in a lot of cases. And more recently, um, if you've been using us, you'll see that we've um, create an addition where you can download a PDF and actually share that with your team. Um, my wife's a vet in a primary practice and they have a lot of interaction behind the scenes, especially handing over cases and, and managing cases in-house. And we've sort of integrated into that as well through various chat functions and WhatsApp groups and stuff like that. It also enables you to share that with the client um, so you can actually start to articulate about what the specialist advised and what you've advised in-house and how to manage that case. So we're starting to sort of integrate that really important triangle of client, primary vet and specialist vet in, in the moment, really. You can add it all to your file, all to your practice management system. Um, when we've spoken to clients, um, to, to, to owners, they're absolutely delighted to stay with the vet that they know and trust, which is you guys out there in, in the veterinary world. Um, and, the, and But what they also want is that support and the clear detailed next steps to reduce the uncertainty for both them. And what we found when we speak to our vet clients is that it, actually our service really helps with the uncertainty and decision making in practice. And, and often it's just saying, look, guys, you're on the right track and this is what we do. And we just augment that a little bit. We're really, really easy to use. I haven't got my mobile phone with me at the moment, but we've got an app um, which is really, really useful, especially for orthopedics. So um, in the sense that videos, photos, um, a really, really essential part of any clinical um, sort of information that we can get. And you can do that through the app, you can do it through the desktop, um, and you can use those sort of multi-modalities multi really. 
Um, in terms of how you use us, you don't need a subscription necessarily. Pl lots and lots of our practice teams have a subscription, but you can actually just get case advice case by case on a what we call a pay as you go basis. So we're really, really flexible. We're very, very cost efficient. We're fully sort of supportive for you guys in practice. So if you want any more information, um, scan that QR code there if you can. Um, if not, have a look back at the webinar as well. So um, next slide, if you can, Pilar, please. If you ever want a demonstration or to talk more, then please reach out to myself or our team. Um, my email is there, richard.artingstall at vetct.com or contact one of our um, support team and we will just guide you through that as well. Uh, next step, next slide, sorry. So just a bit of housekeeping for today. Um, everybody that's registered will get a link pretty quickly after the um, webinar finishes where you've got the full recording so you can watch that back and listen to it. Um, we will be on mute all the way through. If you've got any questions, then at the bottom of the screen, I think there's a QA and a box. So pop those in um, throughout if anything springs to mind or at the end, and we'll have a section at the end where we'll be discussing those questions and seeing what Pilar thinks as well. So uh, next slide, please. Great, so just to introduce Pilar, um, Pilar's fantastic. She's one of our integral orthopedic surgeons here at VETCT, has been with us for a long time and a really valued member of the team. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon at heart and Pilar's advice is second to none, so fully endorsed from me. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today is top tips for localizing lameness in dogs and cats. Um, really tricky area. Um, and also a very logical area as well. And with um, really good advice, um, you will become experts in this. So I'm gonna hand over to Pilar and uh, I look forward to this. So over to you, Pilar. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, thank you everyone for being here tonight, either live or if you are watching this webinar uh, at a later time. So thank you very much for coming. So today we are gonna be talking about uh, the top tips or my recommendations or my, my advice to localizing lameness in dogs and cats. <clears throat> so if we see uh, this dog, oh, I don't know why it's showing uh, this small, but this is the typical dog that comes with an orthopedic issue, with a lameness in some animals. This is easier to see. In other animals, it's a little bit more difficult. This dog is... Um, lame on the right hind. Let me put it again. You see, it's, uh, it's uh, moving the left hind faster than the right. In some cases, evaluation of lameness can be uh, easier than others. So I will go through the different steps or how can you um, uh, better evaluate uh, lameness in dogs. So there are a few steps that we need to do or we need to take to get to uh, the diagnosis of what the orthopedic problem is, is, is in our patient. And one of them is obviously doing a, a, a lameness evaluation, but there are also other steps that are really essential to be able to uh, uh, reach this diagnosis in, in orthopedics. So today we are gonna be talking about the different types of gates and uh, what is lameness, how to identify lameness, the different techniques that we can use to evaluate lameness. And uh, with, uh, in, in some cases, uh, the type of lameness that we see is pretty much patognomonic for a specific condition. But in other, in other cases, uh, knowing a little bit of the signalment of the patient can also give us a lot of uh, information and clues of what's the most likely cause. But really to reach a diagnosis, we need to do other steps uh, outside of uh, lameness evaluation, uh, which we wouldn't, we don't have time to go through today. So mainly I'm focusing on uh, lameness evaluation today. So what is lameness, first of all? It's uh, this abnormal uh, gait or abnormal uh, movement of the, of the body. It can affect one limb, it can affect several limbs at the same time. And there are different uh, causes for, for lameness. The most common is pain. So the animal has some type of pain, inflammation in a joint or in a bone that is causing uh, uh, pain and therefore lameness. But also lameness can be caused by an anatomical deformity, an abnormal position of the limbs. Also, it can be purely mechanical, like in this dog that we see in the photo. You can see 
and uh, an abduction of the elbow and abduction or external rotation actually of the of the limb. This is a mechan We will see what the uh, condition that is uh, associated with this type of uh, uh, of lameness, but this is a purely mechanical lameness. The, the dog is not painful, it's just mechanically uh, the limb is like that. And also obviously we can have abnormal gait when we have a motor or sensory dysfunction. Uh, so generally uh, a neurological condition. So what happens when an animal have, uh, has lameness is putting less weight or is using that limb less. So they are gonna have muscle atrophy, uh, decrease in uh, range of motion of the joints, uh, decrease strength in the muscle, decrease mass, as I was saying before, muscle atrophy. We can also see changes in the body movements. In uh, They are trying to compensate for that pain, so they may change the, uh, their posture and their normal movement. And actually, that can affect other structures. And typically, uh, animals with uh, lumbosacral disease, for example, hip dysplasia or crucial ligament disease, they are going to have iliopsoas strain, which could be primary, but also secondary to the other conditions. So we can, we can see that, especially during our orthopedic examination. So there are different types of, uh, of gait. The slower gait is the, is the walk. Uh, here in some uh, occasions, there are three paws on the floor. And at the order, you can see in this video, the order is right hind, right four, left hind, left four. It's quite slow. They can increase the speed, and that will be amble. And then if we increase uh, a little bit more the speed, we will have a pace, uh, which is the advancement. I'm going to stop it here. Is the advancement of the limbs in the same side at the same time. This is an abnormal gait. It's not a, a, a physiological uh, gait. Usually, animals show pace, or they are pacing when they have been trained to do this type of gait or when they have an orthopedic uh, or a neurological condition. Uh, it's a very inefficient um, gait. Um, then we can progress into the trot, which is uh, uh, more common. There is this diagonal advancement of the, uh, of the limbs, and there is an aerial phase of suspension. Then we go into counter, which is faster, um, with uh, it just I cannot go through all the position of the uh, of the limbs and then to the gallop, which they have another uh, two suspension uh, uh, moments. But uh, the the most important uh, gates that we are going to use when evaluating lameness is at walk and at trot. Okay. So you know that during uh, gait there are different or two phases during gait. We have the stance phase. Uh, which is where the foot is touching the floor. And then we have the swing phase, which is where the limb is actually on the air and is trying to reposition and advance uh, moving, moving forward. Um, also, the weight distribution is different between the fore limbs and the hind limbs. Generally, it varies slightly depending on the breed, but generally uh, we, we say that it's around 60% in the four limbs and 40% on the four limbs. And this is important, especially if we use some uh, technology to evaluate uh, lameness, as we will uh, talk about this, or I will talk about this a little bit later. So the first thing when we have a patient, an orthopedic patient, obviously the clients are going to uh, uh, tell us that the animal is lame or they think it's painful and then we will see the lameness. So first of all, we need to ask ourselves some questions. Uh, the first one is we need to see if the patient is lame or not. Where are they lame? In which limb? We need to identify which limb is the one that is uh, lame, which limb or limbs. What type of lameness uh, it is? If it's a weight-bearing lameness, non-weight-bearing lameness, uh, if it looks like a, a mechanical lameness, uh, for example, uh, which severity they are showing uh, or which severity this, uh, this lameness is so we can grade it. And that's important uh, also to evaluate the progression after treatment for that patient. And things that we will ask the clients is uh, how did the lameness start and how is progressing? If they've done anything, if they have started any treatment uh, or another colleague have, has started any treatment. So for example, in this dog, <clears throat> the first thing we need to ask ourselves is if the dog is lame, okay? And we will go through which signs we need to check to know if a dog is lame. But this dog is lame in the right four because there is a clear head bob, 
and we will go through this. This is another dog, it's a different type of lameness. This dog has more like a choppy gait uh, in the four limbs. So probably both uh, will be affected, but we can see, let's see if it's coming back. This dog is more lame in the left four. And, 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 and I will uh, be a little bit more specific about what do we see, but generally when a dog is lame in one leg, uh, in one limb, they are gonna try to put a uh, weight in that leg during uh, a, a shorter time. So they are trying to advance the, uh, the contralateral limb faster. So they are gonna do kind of like this movement. And also there's gonna be a head bob. They are trying to move the center uh, um, or, or the weight uh, from uh, the fore limbs to the hind limbs or uh, the other way around, depending on if one of the fore limbs is affected or one of the hind limbs is affected. This dog has a very clear, very obvious lameness. It's almost non-weight bearing. It's just toe touching. So this is a very easy lameness to, to evaluate. It's not always that easy. In this dog, again, especially when it's turning, we can see that the, the dog is um, obviously lame on the left hind. It's uh, trying not to put too much weight and it's moving the right hind faster. But actually, the dog shows kind of like a choppy gait, a shorter stride in both of the hind limbs. So that should make you suspicious that the dog may have a bilateral condition. So it's, it's, it's obviously moving the right hind faster when putting weight on the left, but then also move the left uh, uh, fast again, not as fast as the right, but it gives you a little bit of an idea that the dog may have a bilateral condition. So, um, <clears throat> First of all, we need to take a detailed history that's going to give us some clues about, uh, well, first, what type of lameness we are in front of. And also, we can start thinking about which conditions can be, could be causing this lameness. So um, we need to get as much information as we can to try to get to the diagnosis of that dog. So if we're talking about the uh, history taking about the lameness, we need to ask the client, uh, which leg they think is affected. Sometimes they are right, sometimes they are wrong. But if one of the limbs is affected or both or several limbs are affected, what's the frequency of the lameness? It, it is intermittent. It is associated with um, exercise or uh, when they are resting. So the lameness is more prominent after uh, being resting or is all the time, is present all the time. So I, I was saying, what type of presentation? If it's before exercise or is after exercise? What what's the severity of the lameness? How long it's been going on? If there's any possi uh, possible triggering event, if there was any associated trauma uh, in the time where the lameness started, or if it's more like a progressive uh, lameness. Also, how much exercise that animal does. Uh, so if it's a pet mainly, a couch potato or uh, if it's a really athlete dog, uh, if it's an, a sporting or a working dog, obviously the expectations of the clients are gonna be different uh, when they have a pet uh, versus when they have a, a, a working dog, for example, or a sporting uh, dog. And also if they've, if they've received any previous treatment. So all this is gonna give us information about the lameness um, in that patient. Also, we need to ask them about um, any travel history, uh, if they've seen any parasites or any, um, you know, ticks, or if they've traveled to an area with mosquitoes, like the Mediterranean area. Uh, and this is important because depending on the type of lameness that we see, especially uh, this travel history and the presence of ticks and things like that is associated with uh, uh, polyarthritis. So um, we may see a dog that actually is lame in uh, several limbs, um, so that's going to give us clues and it's going to help us uh, reach a diagnosis. Also, what type of diet the animal is receiving in case there is a nutritional um, disease, medication that they are receiving um, uh, currently, or if they have uh, uh, received a vaccination uh, lately, also related to a possible polyarthritis, for example. So this is, uh, is, is important in, as one of the steps to be able to actually reach a diagnosis of what the problem is. 
So generally, what, while I'm taking the history, when I, I'm talking to the clients in the, um, in the console room, I let the dog walk freely in the room. So they, they feel a little bit more relaxed. They can sit down. Uh, you can sometimes see a little bit more clearly what type of lameness it is, because when you are doing the proper lameness evaluation, sometimes they are very uh, scared and they won't show uh, the lameness. So when they are relaxed, because they, they think that you are not watching them, you are talking to the clients, you can see a little bit how they move and uh, see if you can see any, any lameness. Also, um, different postures. So for example, this is a dog. Um, this way of sitting, this is a sit test that we uh, that we usually do for cranial crucial ligament disease. But you can see when the animal is walking around and sitting, if they sit like that with the legs uh, abducted, uh, so they are painful uh, when flexing the stifle. So they tend to sit with the limb abducted. That way they don't need to flex the stifle that much because it's, it's painful. Uh, in comparison to a normal dog with no cranial crucial ligament disease, when they sit, they sit square with the legs just under the body. So that will be the right way of sitting while um, this way will be abnormal. And that's very typical of animals with uh, crucial ligament disease. But obviously, uh, you know, animals with tarsal uh, problems also, they are going to be painful flexing the tarsus. So we may see a position that is uh, very similar. We can also see, as I was saying, how they are walking. In cats, you can see if they are trying to jump on uh, on a chair or uh, or if they can or not. So that's going to give you uh, clues. The next step uh, that is going to help us a lot is to take into account the signalment of the patient. Obviously, the species. Uh, so cats are going to have, some of the conditions are going to be uh, the same, but others are going to be different. Um, so we need to take into account if it's a cat, if it's a dog, also the age. Some conditions are more prevalent in, uh, in animals of different ages. So, for example, in puppies, we are going to see mainly conditions uh, related to laxity or to, el to osteochondrosis, um, elbow dysplasia, for example. While in senior dogs, we are going to see um, uh, some conditions uh, related to osteoarthritis or uh, neoplastic processes. Also, the breed is going to help us reach a, a diagnosis. And also, by looking at the lameness, we are going to be, a, be, a, be able to start thinking about what condition or which condition is more likely to be uh, taking place in that, in that patient. Um, so some breeds are overrepresented for some conditions. For example, it's very common to have uh, German Shepherd dogs with a canine hip dysplasia or a Labrador Retriever with elbow dysplasia or greyhounds with an osteosarcoma or an erosive osteoarthritis. Arthritis. So um, all this information is going to help us uh, reach a diagnosis and put everything together with our lameness evaluation and get that um, diagnosis. Also, males can be more affected by some orthopedic conditions like uh, osteochondrosis. So it's something that we need to have in mind. If they have been neutered because they are generally... Um, the growth plates will close later and they can be predisposed to suffer some, um, uh, some conditions, especially cats, for example, or, and also they gain weight and that, that can uh, speed up um, the, um, the progression of osteoarthritis in animals with elbow dysplasia, for example. So all that is going to give us information. Obviously, the next step, and I'm giving these steps uh, in chronological order, so how I do it. Uh, so I, well, I look at this, uh, at the file, obviously, and I take into account the signalman, I take the history, I look at the animal while uh, walking around in the console room. And then before I start touching the patient, I do my uh, lameness examination and gait evaluation. So the most common way of evaluating gait is uh, by visual observation, but this is a subjective technique. There are other techniques that are objectives, which are kinetics. Uh, with this technique, we measure the forces that are going through that limb or the different limbs and kinematics, where we measure the movement of the different limbs, different joints and, and limbs. But let's start with a visual observation, which is something that we do uh, on a daily basis in our, in our clinics. So what we do and what I showed you in the videos before is we evaluate uh, the movements of the limbs, of the body, and we check and see if that's normal or not. If that movement of the joint is maybe flexing less or there's over uh, hyperextension, for example, 
the, the, the whole segment, the whole limb, how is it moving, is it in a normal position, if it's uh, is, uh, circumducting uh, while walking, and in general, all this uh, movement of the, of the body. We also, um, and we do this all together, but I'm putting things a, a little bit apart. Uh, we, al we also check the time or how much time that leg is in contact uh, on the floor, because when a, when, a, uh, when a limb or a joint is painful, they are gonna try to put weight through that limb uh, for a shorter time. So that they are gonna have a shorter stance phase of that, uh, in, that, uh, in that limb. So we are checking with our visual uh, observation, we are checking that uh, time, uh, the stance time. We are also checking the, uh, the step length how long that step is, and generally is shorter because they are putting the neck, the contralateral limb, they are moving it faster because they are gonna, uh, they don't wanna put too much, uh, or they, are, they don't wanna put weight on the, uh, uh, on the painful limb for a long time. So they are gonna move the contralateral limb faster. So that uh, distance, that step and stride distance is gonna be shorter. Um, we can also see sometimes just by standing, we can see differences in symmetry. We can see that the animal is uh, tilting or is favoring one, uh, one side or the other. Uh, so I do this all this visual observation before I do any physical contact or any orthopedic uh, evaluation. So it's very important that we try to do this evaluation at two different, well, in motion. Um, obviously, when the animal is standing, we can see that uh, tilting uh, of the uh, sometimes of the of the weight, uh, but generally lameness evaluation obviously is evaluated in motion, and generally we do it at walk and at trot. Some sometimes um, a lameness that is not visible at walk, it will be visible at trot because it's a more unstable uh, uh, gait. Uh, there's only two limbs in contact with the floor, so it's a bit more unstable, and they can show lameness a trot that they don't show lameness at, at walk. So we need to always um, check the lameness at walk and at trot. And what I try to do is I, I try to evaluate or I have the dog walking towards me, away from me, and then from the side. So when evaluating the dog uh, walking towards me, that's going to be, um, it's going to facilitate the evaluation of lim lameness, especially in the four limbs. And also we are going to be able to see uh, more easily the head bob in the, uh, well, in the head, obviously in the four limbs. When they are walking away from us, we are going to be able to evaluate a little bit better any lameness in the hind limbs. So we can focus on the hind limbs when they are walking away. We can focus on the four limbs when they are walking towards us. Otherwise, it's very difficult to evaluate all four limbs when they are walking. So we need to focus on the four limbs or the hind limbs at different times. And also, and many people don't do this, but walking the dog in front of you is very useful because you can see actually um, the range of motion of the joints, especially the hip. You can see if the animal is actually properly extending the hips uh, or reaching and extending the shoulder, for example, or flexing the stifle um, adequately. In animals with, um, with more subtle, subtle lameness, uh, sometimes we can... Um, um, see better if there's lameness or not when we make them uh, do a circle, walk in a circle or in a figure of eight even. Uh, so when you walk them in a circle, the limb that is inside of that circle um, uh, will show the lameness more easily because they are putting more weight on that, uh, on that side. Um, so you can exacerbate a little bit the lameness when walking them in a circle. So you can you can do it in both directions, depending on which one is you think is lame. But generally, we do it in both directions, and then it's easier to see the lameness generally in the in the leg that is in the inside part of the of the circle. So, for example, this dog. Now that I, um, so what what do you think this uh, which lame is uh, which limb is lame? So in this case, for example, we are walking the dog towards me. There is a clear head bob, and I will go uh, now uh, talking about the different uh, tips uh, of evaluating uh, lameness. So this dog has a clear head bob, is lifting the leg when the left fore is on the floor. And you may need to do this uh, at the slow motion if you can. And I'll talk about uh, slow motion videos. You can see that the dog lifts the head when putting down the left fore, 
and then uh, lower the head when it's, um, uh, the right fore is touching the floor. Um, so that tells you that the left fore is painful and that's why it's trying to lift the head and move all the way towards the hind limbs. Also, when putting the left fore on the floor, uh, this dog is trying to put the right fore quicker on the floor because that left is, uh, is uh, painful. So when we have a dog with unilateral lameness, we can see the, the, the things that we can see to say, okay, the dog is lame in this limb is, I mean, if the dog is very lame, severely lame, they can keep the leg up and not put in any weight. So it's a non-weight bearing lameness. That would be very obvious that the dog is lame in that, in that leg, but it's not always the case. So what we are gonna see, as I was saying before, we are gonna, be a, we are gonna see a shorter stance phase with the limb that is affected. And uh, we are gonna see a shorter swing phase uh, in the contralateral limb. So because the, for example, in this dog, because the left fore is, uh, is painful, uh, is gonna try to put uh, weight on that one for a shorter period of time. So it's gonna move the right fore quicker. So the, um, the swing phase on the right fore is gonna be shorter. That's what I mean. So the, the stance phase on the affected limb is going to be shorter and the swing phase of the non-affected limb, the uh, contralateral is going to be shorter. Um, also, we can see abnormal positions of the limb. We can see some external rotation depending on the condition. We can see circumduction when they have a very limited uh, range of motion or they don't want to move, uh, flex and extend too much a joint. They may do this circumduction. And also it's very helpful to evaluate the movement of the head, what we call a head bob. So for example, this is the same dog as before. When the dog is putting, uh, um, or when they are putting the leg down, the one that is painful on the floor, they are gonna lift the head because that way they are moving um, the, um, the, the weight of the, of the body, the center um, um, of the body weight is moving towards the hind limbs. So they are putting less weight on the forelimbs. And when they are putting the, the limb that is not painful on the floor, they are doing the opposite. They are moving the center of gravity uh, towards the forelimb. Uh, so they are lowering the head. So in the forelimbs, when the, the affected limb is, is uh, on the floor, the head goes up. When the non-affecting leg is uh, on the floor, the heads go down. The head goes down. When it's in the hind limbs, it's the opposite. Uh, when the affected limb is uh, on the floor, they are going to lower the head because they are trying to move the weight towards the forelimb uh, when the affected limb is uh, on the floor. And when the non-affecting limb is uh, on the floor, they are going to lift the head uh, because they are moving again all the weight towards the hind limb. So it's different when we are talking about the head bow is going to be different when we have a, a forelimb lameness than when we have a hind limb lameness. Okay. So for example, this dog, as I was saying before, this is, this is a dog that is uh, lame on the left fore. And you can see in some occasions is more obvious than, than others, uh, but he's lifting the head when the left fore is down. Let me just put it again, because it's more obvious at times. So for example, here, up, 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 up. And it's up when the left fore is, uh, is on the floor. But it's, um, it's, it's variable and, and that's why you need to pay quite attention uh, and, and maybe walk the dog several times and do it you know, towards you, uh, away from you, from the side. And that way you can uh, evaluate uh, what I mentioned before, the stance, uh, the, the, the stance phase, how long it takes, uh, and especially the head bob. There are some conditions that will have some characteristic gates, and actually they are pretty much patognomonic. So, for example, we have this dog. <coughs> and do you see, I mean, you need to have a quick eyes, I guess, to, to see it because the movement is quite quick. I'm putting it in slow motion, and I will talk about the slow motion uh, videos before, uh, after in a little bit. So you can see that the dog, during the swing phase, the dog is uh, internally rotating the paw and externally rotating the tarsus, both in the right and the left. So he's doing it bilaterally. It's kind of like this uh, Michael Jackson movement, right, uh, with the leg. This uh, gait is actually patognomonic for gracilis contractures. So the gracilis muscle is a, is a muscle that is in the 
um, in the medial side of the of the thigh. So when it's contracted, it it causes this internal rotation of the um, of the tibia and and the paw, an external rotation or external movement of the tarsus. So this is very pathognomonic. If you see this type of lameness, this is a gracilis contracture. Another very characteristic uh, gait is this dog. Uh, this is the photo that I showed you before. This dog um, is, is showing this, um, let me put it from the beginning again, is showing this external rotation of the left forelimb. Um, so it's a mechanical lameness. This lameness is very characteristic or is pathognomonic pretty much of uh, infraspinatus contracture. Again, it's a mechanical lameness and because the, infra, the infraspinatus causes external rotation because it's in, it inserts in the lateral aspect of the proximal humerus, when it contracts, it will rotate from the humerus and distal. So it causes all this uh, external rotation of the, of the limb. So this is a typical gait of a dog with infraspinatus contracture. So once, uh, obviously, we detect which limb or limbs are affected, um, the recommendation is to grade uh, the severity of the, of the lameness. Um, so we can use a numerical range from 0 to 5 or 0 to 10, 0 being sound and 5 or 10 being the maximum severity, uh, non-weight bearing. We can use the visual analog scale uh, where we have a line and we just put a cross uh, from uh, one end to the other. Uh, one end will be a, a sound dog and the other end will be a, a maximal severity and non-weight bearing uh, lameness so we can put it uh Across where we think the dog is lame, and that way we can monitor the progression of the of the lameness in that dog. So visual observation, there is evidence that visual observation or visual gait analysis is subjective. Uh, there is very strong intra-observer agreement. So when I evaluate dogs, I will use the same internal uh, grading, this numerical grading. It will be pretty much very consistent uh, with myself, but with other clinicians. This uh, agreement is not as strong, uh, but this uh, agreement increases with worsening of the lameness. So lameness that is more obvious, uh, observers tend to agree more than when we have a more subtle uh, lameness. And some people will say it's a two out of 10. Another one will say it's a three or a four. So there's less agreement. But it's, it's been reported that there's poor correlation with objective gait analysis. But um, I mean, it's readily available. Uh, is necessary, so we, we need to do it, is immediately accessible, and there's no equipment required. So it's subjective, but it's, it can actually be uh, very useful in evaluating these, uh, uh, these patients. The problem is when we have bilateral lameness. Um, so these animals, like this one here, you can see that um, that right hind uh, has a shorter um, step, um, so it's more lame on the right hind, but actually both hind legs, the animal has this uh, uh, choppy gait in both hind limbs. So this dog had a bilateral uh, crucial ligament disease, but it was more pronounced or the, the animal was more lame on the right hind, but actually both uh, hind limbs had this choppy gait, this shorter uh, uh, step. Um, also, we may have dogs with bilateral lameness when they have these wobbling hips generally associated with uh, canine hip dysplasia, like in this dog. Although, you know, dogs with uh, uh, neurological conditions may show a similar uh, lameness, but generally they tend to cross uh, the hind limbs or they have neurological uh, deficits. And other uh, animals that can be difficult to evaluate the lameness are small breed dogs because they move the legs really quickly. And we may not be able to actually see with our naked eyes where the, the, uh, the lameness is, in which limb uh, it is. So, for example, in this dog, I, you know, you need to walk the dog uh, 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 many times. And the dog is lame in the right hind. It's putting the leg less time than the left, uh, than the left hind. So it's trying to move the left hind uh, quicker. But it's, you can see that it's more difficult in small breed dogs. You also need to be careful with animals with neurological conditions. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. So in this case, sometimes the uh, lameness is quite obvious. That is neurological, like in this dog. You can tell that the dog is 
crossing over the hind limbs, is almost falling over when uh, turning. Uh, so this dog is ataxic. Um, so when you evaluate the gait, you can see that this dog looks drunk. Uh, the dog is, uh, is, is ataxic, it's not an orthopedic, uh, uh, or it's not a lameness secondary to an orthopedic uh, condition. It, it obviously looks ataxic. What do we do with cats? Um, so cats uh, are a little bit more difficult to evaluate uh, lameness because they don't collaborate too much. Um, so what I do is I leave them, you know, in the room. Let's see the video runs. So I leave them in the in the room. I put the carrier in the middle of the of the room, and I let the cat. Generally, they want to go into the into the carrier, so you can make them walk a little bit more. Uh, but they tend to walk more in a crouched position, so it's more difficult to evaluate uh, lameness. Um, you can check if they want to jump on a, on a chair or if they have difficulties, and um, uh, you can ask the clients actually to uh, record a video at home where they feel more comfortable and then evaluate lameness. Um, in cats, a lameness generally, although you can use the same uh, numerical uh, grading system, generally we just say if it's a low grade, medium grade, or high grade lameness, because they are a little bit more difficult to evaluate. So um, obvious lameness can be detected by visual observation, but when we have an animal with a more subtle lameness or an animal that is very stoic or a small breed dogs with a rapid uh, limb movement, uh, this lameness can be more difficult. So what can we do uh, to help in this lameness evaluation. We can use a slow motion video, or we can use this objective uh, gait analysis, kinetics and kinematics. So um, there are different apps uh, that you can use to record a video in a slow motion, like uh, the one that I show you, or actually you can just record a video with your phone and then in your computer, you can play it a little bit in a different, uh, in a slow motion. You can decrease the speed by 25%, 40%, or 50%, or you can actually make it faster. So there are different ways. And for example, in the video that I showed you before, if you are not very used to seeing um, uh, this type of lameness, you may miss it because the movement of the tarsus is very quick. So in these cases, the slow motion videos can be very, very useful. Or in animals with small breed dogs with a rapid uh, limb movement, in those cases, seeing the video in slow motion can help you detect the lameness. So I think it's very useful. There was this paper that was done um, um, a few years ago, uh, and we saw that um, these uh, slow motion videos can be useful in some patients, especially, you know, working dogs, competition dogs, where the lameness is very subtle in animals with uh, uh, small breed animals. And uh, we saw that there was greater inter-observer agreement, but unfortunately it was not statistically significant. So um, there's more need for more, uh, there's need for more uh, studies, but Generally, in a daily practice, I think can be useful in some um, in some cases. And then kinetics, as I mentioned before, we measure the forces going through the limbs. Uh, we can use a force plate or we can use a pressure mat. The force plate actually measures uh, the force through the limb in three dimensions or well, in three directions, vertical, craniocaudal, and mediolateral. And actually that plate uh, will give you the ground reaction forces, uh, including the braking propulsion and horizontal forces, and also the impulse, the vertical impulse is the most important one. And it's the gold standard. It can give you a lot of information. Um, and these are uh, pretty much the graphs that uh, you will see. Generally at walk, um, every um, um, time that the paw is on the floor, you will have a biphasic uh, graph uh, because you will have the breaking force and then the propulsion forces. So you will have like this biphasic, which you, you lose it when you uh, evaluate it at trot. Um, uh, but it has some limitations because uh, you need to embed the force plate on the floor and only one limb can be in that uh, force plate. Um, but, it, but it's the gold standard. It gives you a lot of information. So it gives you the information in these vertical forces, horizontal and craniocaudal. The other, um, the other uh, kinetic uh, analysis is with the pressure mat, which is actually a mat, and uh, you walk the dog along the, the mat, and it measures a temporal spatial parameter. So not only the mean vertical in, uh, me, uh, mean 
uh, pressure index, but also the length of the step and the stride. It gives you also the asymmetry indices. So it compares one limb to the other, and it can actually tell you how many sensors are activated when the paw is on the floor. So this is a dog, this is the, um, the a pressure mat. This is a dog uh, walking on the, on the mat. So you can see that obviously the dog is uh, very lame uh, or obviously lame in the right four. You can see the head bob. Let me, oh, let me put it again. Head bob, the head goes up when the right four is on the floor. And that's what we saw with the pressure mat. You can see that the right four is putting uh, uh, less weight or less pressure in comparison to the left four, and actually the left four is compensating. Uh, so this is in comparison to 100% of what they should be placing in that in those limbs. Uh, there are different uh, lengths of uh, of mats. It's portable. You can just roll it up and take it uh, to different uh, places, and it's being validated in humans and dogs. So it can be can be useful. Kinematics is a little bit more, uh, it, it's also useful, but in this case, uh, we measure uh, the movement of the joints and the limbs. So the positions and velocities and acceleration of the different uh, parts of the limbs, the joints, the, uh, uh, the segments. And um, so generally you apply these reflective markers in some specific, uh, generally the, um, uh, the, the joints. And, and then um, you uh, use some cameras to uh, uh, detect where those uh, markers are. So this is, for example, a study that was done by a colleague at the, at the RBC. So there is a pressure uh, force plate uh, embedded on the floor, but the dog also has these markers and you can see all these cameras. So these cameras are detecting where those markers are. And then you need a specific software and with the software, it, uh, it detects the markers and then you can see this in movement and you can measure the angles of flexion and extension and the movement of the different parts. I don't have a lot of experience with this, uh, but it can be, uh, you know, you need, you know, a lot of uh, equipment. So uh, you need to record videos of the patient walking and trotting from both sides. You can do uh, anal the analysis system in 3D or in 2D. And obviously the limitation is that uh, the markers uh, the reflecting markers can move in the skin, um, and that you need, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of equipment. But it gives you um, the different uh, flexion and extension angles in different uh, in different planes, in sagittal, transverse, and frontal plane. Uh, very important. So this will be gait analysis, but obviously to reach the diagnosis, we also need to do a complete physical examination to know how that animal is, if there is any other uh, systemic disease. Um, we need to, you know, do a, a proper physical examination and that will uh, uh, allow us to evaluate if there's any systemic problems, if the animal has fever or if, you if we feel that there are any masses or a heart murmur that could be associated with um, uh, polyarthritis, for example. We also need to do a systematic orthopedic examination uh, in, a, uh, in a specific order. Well, in a specific, it needs to be systematic uh, so that we don't miss anything. So to see if we feel any heat, pain, swelling, joint effusion, crepitus, muscle atrophy, instability, all that is going to give us clues of where that lameness is coming from. So with the gait evaluation, we are going to be able to see which limb is uh, the problematic one where the lameness is, but we need the orthopedic examination to know which area is causing that lameness. But obviously talking about an orthopedic examination, I will need a, a, another hour, okay? So we cannot get through how to do an orthopedic examination uh, at the moment, that's very, very important. And that will allow us to localize exactly the source of the lameness, well, hopefully. Uh, in some occasions, we also need to do neurological evaluation, especially if we suspect that there could be a neurological, uh, that the gait is more neurological than orthopedics. Uh, so we start, you know, checking uh, pain and mobilization of different parts of the spine, proprioception and other postural reflexes and spinal reflexes. And that will give us um, uh, clues. Like in this cat, we can see that the cat is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a toxic as well. Cats are a bit more difficult, but this cat has uh, had neurological. And with all this information, we can 
uh, actually create our differential diagnosis and we and it helps narrowing down the possible um, orthopedic conditions that are causing that lameness and actually guide us to uh, to perform any diagnosis depending on um, the list of differential diagnoses and we can put them in order of um, a likelihood you know at the top you know it's the first at my uh, in my list you know um, so that will uh, help us also as I was saying prioritize some conditions over others then with that we will do diagnostics and I'm not going to go through this but uh, diagnostic imaging, of course, in orthopedics, radiography, most commonly nowadays CT, musculoskeletal ultrasound, even MRI or scintigraphy. We may need to do joint fluid analysis if we suspect of an arthritis, especially polyarthritis. Sometimes we need to do blood work and urine analysis, serology for some um, infectious agents or other tests like uh, uh, intraarticular blockades or uh, taking samples or do some genetics or endocrine tests if we suspect of some specific uh, conditions. Hopefully we can reach a diagnosis so we can formulate a treatment plan that we can treat conservatively or surgically. We need to have a good communication with the clients and then do the treatment either in-house or you know, if we don't feel comfortable, you we can uh, refer uh, to our referral place and we need to follow up those um, uh, those patients. So uh, just uh, because I'm going over the time, uh, some take home messages. Uh, it's very important to get as much uh, prior information as possible that that's going to help us uh, to narrow, narrow down uh, the possible causes for the lameness. We need to do a careful evaluation of the gait in different directions at different speeds um, to properly evaluate the lameness. We need to check for specific signs, so the head bob, the step length, uh, also the different uh, uh, positions of the, of the limbs, as I was saying before. In some occasions, we may need to use technology if it's available, but as I said, slow motion videos is very uh, readily available to everyone. Uh, we need to look for specific patterns of you know, limb positions or um, um, posture, as I was saying before, in the room. And then after lameness evaluation, we will need to perform a systematic and thorough orthopedic examination, which will help us narrow down, narrowing down where the problem is so that we can do all the diagnostics. So thank you very much. Sorry that I went over the time. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and now I will be happy to answer any questions. That's great. Thank you, Pilar. Really good. Um, if you've got any questions, then do pop them in the Q&A. Um... I've certainly got some questions actually just to start off with. So one of the challenges um, that I found when I was in general practice is you've got a relatively limited time to gather all this information. Um, are there any key aspects when you've got 15 minutes and you've got a, and this is putting you on the spot, but when you've got 15 minutes and you've got someone that says, my dog's lame, are there any key aspects on, on what the individual should do um, to, to help them in that short period of time, whether it be trotting the dog up or a clinical exam or, or whatever to, to evaluate that lameness? Well, I, I just think the steps that I mentioned are really critical because the information from the client is going to give us, you know, taking the history is very important, doing the physical exam and things like that. It's just that, um, as I said, sometimes just seeing while taking the history you can actually see how lame the dog is and uh, so that will make the proper gait analysis a bit shorter or maybe you don't need to if if you can see the lameness uh, really easily so that that will shorten the time um and then you can uh, maybe while you do your orthopedic examination you can take the history that will make also uh your appointment a little bit shorter but it's very important actually to do all these steps because you don't want to miss anything. But obviously with experience, you can do things quite quickly. Um, and um, if you don't have time, you can always, you know, take the history, do the evaluation and then take the dog back to the clinic and do the orthopedic examination at a, late, at a later time before doing diagnostics. But um, in 15 minutes, sometimes it can be a little bit challenging. Uh, I have to say, I don't know how people do it. Yeah. I usually take more time. So uh, it's really admirable, actually, to do a, a, an appointment in 15 minutes. Yeah, it can be a real challenge, I think. I think that is the challenge of orthopedics, is that getting that information from the outset. Um, 
I've got plenty of questions, actually. I'm going to ask a couple more, if that's okay. Um, with regards to neurological and orthopedic exam um, conditions concurrently, uh, again, what are your sort of tips with regards to to that? Um, so um, how would you clearly evaluate what your priority is there, whether, whether it's pain or neurological or not? Um, I mean, obviously, sometimes with the gait evaluation, we can clearly see that an animal looks neurological, but the key here will be to do the orthopedic and neurological examination. Sometimes lameness can be similar, as I was saying before, this wobbling of the hind limbs. Uh, with neurological cases, they may cross over, they can uh, uh, do some knuckling, uh, so that will be very obvious that is neurological. But if it's not very clear, the orthopedic and neurological examinations are, are key. With an orthopedic condition, you, may, you will feel abnormalities somewhere, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> well, the, I mean, to be able to reach a diagnosis, you, generally you find something, like crepitus in a joint, uh, an enlarged or an effused joint or painful bone. Um, so that will tell you it's orthopedic. Uh, if it's neurological, you generally, it, you will find some a CP deficit, for example, or painful in, uh, in the lumbosacral area. Um, sometimes if it's not very clear, obviously the, 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 uh, the diagnostic, diagnostic imaging uh, will tell you for sure. Because sometimes, for example, lumbosacral disease, dogs are generally painful on extension of the hips. So if you have a dog that is painful on extension of the hips, it could be the lumbosacral area, it could be the hips, or it could be the iliopsoas. So if you are not very sure, because it's, it's very difficult to isolate all of them, so generally a CT will clarify a little bit more is the hip or the lumbosacral area that is affected. If both, if you are unlucky and both are affected, then it's a little bit trickier. You need to try to isolate either the hips or the lumbosacral area to know for sure which one is affected. So it's not always easy, but um, being very systematic and you know, uh, uh, trying to isolate and also uh, diagnostic imaging will will help. That's great. And on a similar note, um, Sandeep asked a question here that do you commonly get knuckling and scuffing with many orthopedic conditions or can you push that more towards a neurological? Yes, that's more typical of a neurological condition. Uh, I mean, some dogs with osteoarthritis, they can, um, the, the legs, they don't want to, lift the legs too much, but they shouldn't be scuffing. That's more uh, a neurological condition, especially knuckling. Knuckling is, is neurological. It shouldn't be um, orthopedics. Yeah, that's great. I definitely feel there's another talk in here about localizing lameness with a clinical examination, because often some of the questions are around, is it shoulder or elbow? Is it hip or lumbar sacral? Is it knee or is it hip? Um, and they're so interlinked, aren't they? And that's that's one of the challenges. Um, quick, another quick question from me, Stan, stance analyzers. Have you got any thought processes on stance analyzers? Obviously, you touched on the kinematics and the force plate analysis. Now, not every general practice might have access to those necessarily. But certainly in the UK, I mentioned this to you earlier, that I've seen that stance analyzers are um, relatively low cost and some practices are starting to instigate them. Any pros, cons, limitations to something like that? I mean, I, I have mainly used uh, the a pressure mat. Um, I haven't used a stand analyzer, but uh, I could, um, you can, uh, I think some of the limitations can be common between the, the two techniques. Uh, for example, for the, um, the pressure mat, one of the problems is that if the dog looks towards the right or is pulling from the neck that's going to change completely well completely it can change how much pressure the um the mat is uh is measuring in the different limbs so it can actually affect the reading so i i, I assume and i would expect the same to be with the standing um with with these uh equi pieces of equipment if the animal is standing but is distracted and is looking to the right or the left or is moving towards the front. And that's going to change uh, the uh, the amount of pressure in the different limbs, which may not correlate to the actual uh, what's happening in the dog. So I think that's a, a big limitation of the a big limitation in this uh, in this system. 
Okay, that's great. Okay, great. Uh, I think we've come to the end of the hour. Thank you, Pilar, for such a great talk. Um, if you've got any other questions, please email them in. If you'd like, I think we might have one more slide, actually, if you want to just... Hi, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, if you've got any questions, then please email them in. Um, and then if you want a demonstration, if you want to know more about specialist case advice, please contact us. Um, there's a QR code there or just get in contact. And thank you, Pilar, for a great talk. Um, we've got, oh, we've got more webinars coming up. Um, I think we've got two more before, before Christmas or maybe one more before Christmas. I think we've got um, Kate Murphy talking on Pyrexia of Unknown Origin and tips and tricks on that, which is going to be fascinating as well. So do scan those and get into contact if you want to. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time, everybody. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. And thank you very much, yeah. everyone, for your attention.